Your VFW department is proud to present the Service with Honor video collection. Dedicated to the courageous men and women who served our country in Vietnam, these stories and images bring to life the realities of a war only a veteran can understand. Each video in this remarkable series recounts in vivid detail the daily physical and emotional struggles of the men and women who served their country so well during this important conflict. See real-life battlefield footage. Hear the true stories of Vietnam from the young Americans who served there. Feel the bond among these brave and dedicated heroes and how the Vietnam experience affected not only their lives, but also the lives of their families and all Americans. Your VFW department presents the Service with Honor video collection as a lasting and important record of Vietnam, preserving the honor of those who served. Although many years have passed since Vietnam, the memories and stories presented here are real and powerful. Indeed, they are unforgettable. The first round hit the point man and killed him dead right in his tricks. And then all help them. The dense hills of Dok Tho, the sky soldiers of the 173rd Airborne, had walked into a deadly North Vietnamese Army ambush. The amount of firepower was just amazing. Smoke, napalm, the smell of burnt gunpowder. They started hitting us with just about everything. We were pretty well pinned down at that point. And there was just screaming everywhere. Outnumbered by an invisible enemy, the men of the 173rd fight for their lives on Hill 875. I'm Jack Smith, and these are the stories of the Vietnam War told by the people who know it best, those who fought it. I was one of them. Behind me, the Wall That Heals, a replica of Washington's Vietnam Memorial that is trucked around the nation so everyone can pay their respects to those who gave their lives in Vietnam. Among more than 58,000 names of American dead on the wall are 158 from the Battle of Dot Tho. The soldier story begins in the fall of 1967 five years after the first American advisors arrived. They are just a small part of the half million man U.S. force there at the time, but they are destined for one of the war's most intense battles. In November, American intelligence learns that the North Vietnamese are preparing an attack on Dot Tho, a strategic point in the mountainous central highlands. If they succeed, the NVA could then sweep eastwards across the country to the coast, splitting Vietnam in half. The American commander-in-chief, William Westmoreland, has no intention of letting that happen. He has in mind just the unit to take care of it, the 173rd Airborne. The men of the 173rd Airborne Brigade have a well-deserved reputation as tough fighters. 5,200 paratroopers make up a highly mobile fighting force that can move quickly into action in the air or on the ground, traveling only with what they can carry on their backs. General Westmoreland calls the 173rd his fire brigade, an elite force he uses all over Vietnam to put out fires wherever they flare up. Our, our 173rd was a special little team, and he could always call them up anytime he wanted to. We saw like his... Uh, his little special forces, I would say. And he just thought the sun rise and set in the 173rd. The 173rd is a volunteer force of mostly patriotic teenagers from American cities, small towns, and farms. They all want the glory of fighting for their country and the thrill of being a sky soldier. Al Ziegler, from a small town in South Carolina, is a proud member of Westmoreland's fire brigade. He would put us on a real challenging mission. I mean, some of them was very challenging because he figured that we could do it. And he was very close to the 173rd. But when General Westmoreland's command orders the Sky Soldiers to dock tow in November 1967, not a man in the brigade is happy about it. Dock tow is where the 173rd suffered its worst losses yet, only five months earlier in June, when the 2nd Battalion was hit badly in an ambush. 
Steve Doc Camp, a medic in the 2nd Battalion, was cut off from the action. A Company was already halfway up the hill, and they got hit by the main force, and they got overran. And we could hear them fighting up there while the smaller force was keeping us back, keeping us from getting up there. The battle lasted less than 24 hours, but 76 Americans were killed. Of those, 43 had fatal head wounds, most certainly a result of North Vietnamese executions. And the NVA had vanished, leaving the 173rd with nothing but a very bad feeling about Doc Tho. Now, the men of the 173rd are back in the jungles of Doc Tho on a mission of search and destroy to find the North Vietnamese Army and spoil their plans for taking Doc Tho. It will be a challenge even for the 173rd. Doc Tho is an area of treacherous mountains and dense jungle close to Laos and Cambodia, deep in the heart of a North Vietnamese army stronghold. The rugged terrain makes it difficult to defend against an elusive enemy that can and easily does retreat across the border. Retracing the steps that had led the 173rd into an NVA ambush only five months earlier seemed like a bad idea to Fred Shipman, who had always wanted to be a paratrooper like his father. When we were given orders to move back to Doc Tho, I think we all, um, I'm not sure apprehensive is the right word, but th there was a element of um, unhappiness. We, this was not a good place to go. Louis Zuko had always dreamed of flying through the clouds when he was growing up in California. But now he finds himself stuck on the ground, beating a path through the dense bush, wearing an 80-pound pack, straining his whole body to hear a sign of the NVA. Oh, man, it was just rain, mud, leeches, snakes, uh, sleeping on the ground, ambushes, humping, humping, walking, humping, heat. You, sometimes you could see steam coming off the jungle floor. It was so hot. 18-year-old Ray Zacone, a machine gunner with the 173rd from a small town in Idaho, already knows what it means to come up against the battle-hardened North Vietnamese Army. Most of the time when you got in a firefight with the NVA, you were outnumbered and you were outgunned. The men of the 173rd are in a heightened state of alert on their march through the mountains. They feel North Vietnamese eyes watching them, and they see evidence that the NVA have had time to construct deep underground cave-like bunkers and connecting trenches, even to run blue communications wire up the mountain, which they don't even bother to conceal. They were very well protected. They were very difficult to, uh, to dislodge. It weighed on you, you know, you just day after day after day, and you, it, uh, it was not a good feeling. For 10 days, the men cut paths through the jungle and hills, but the main force of North Vietnamese eludes them until Armistice Day, a day Americans usually set aside to commemorate the laying down of arms. On this November 11th, the men of the 173rd finally engage their enemy, an invisible enemy who has seen them first and attacks without warning. And the jungle came alive. The ambush was sprung, and the platoon suffered 50% casualties right off the bat. We had walked into a U-shaped ambush. 20-year-old Sergeant Bob Wooldridge had requested duty in Vietnam, but this was not what he had in mind. Surrounded by an unseen enemy, the more than 300 men of the 2nd Battalion drop their packs and dash for cover. You're really fighting at that time back to back, and everyone is, is fighting for each other. Because you know the only way you can survive is your partner survive. You have a good chance of surviving. So uh, it was just we had one little tight back to back circle. Bob Wooldrich is with his buddy Phil Scharf, a 20-year-old from the Midwest who has been in Vietnam only five months when both are hit. We were wounded by a mortar. The first mortar round landed and blew us back about 15 meters. Uh, I was hit in the face, chest, and arm. Uh, Phil was hit in the face. 
various parts of his body. And I yelled for a medic. And another mortar round went off and it blew me forward. I took a rather large chunk in the back of my leg and in my entire backside. That's when I was wounded to the point that I wasn't going to be moving around anymore. We proceeded to fight with what we had. We were running out of ammo, so you would kill one of them and take his weapon and use it. For Wooldridge, Scharf, and the rest of the 2nd Battalion, their only chance for survival is resupply by helicopter. The lifeline for the 173rd is the 335th Assault Helicopter Company, known as the Cowboys. 22-year-old Gary Bass is a cowboy pilot who's flying his UH-1 Huey over the thick jungle and coming under heavy fire. So we pulled out, taking quite a few rounds, and pulled out and came back around. And finally on the fourth pass, the crew said, uh, there's Americans below us, so we kicked the sling load off. Well, unfortunately, in retrospect, the Americans that they saw below us were dead. And the sling load of grenades and stuff like that went to the enemy. The jungle's thick, triple canopy makes accurate drops almost impossible. But Bass makes his mark the second time. Landing is another matter. Finally, by late afternoon, the battle dies down enough for Bass and the other chopper pilots to touch down with more supplies and to carry out the wounded. One of the hardest things, I think, was making them take wounded off. You know, you'd go in, they'd, they'd put as many as they could get on the floor, and you just literally couldn't get out. You'd have to have them take about half of them off to even be able to get out of this hover hole. I was lucky enough that night, they put me on a chopper, and I was medevaced back to a, an area like a mass unit, like a place where they could operate on you and remove some of the shrapnel. Phil Scharf would recover, but on that armistice day, 20 men of the 173rd die, and 154 are wounded in brutal combat. But the dark jungles of Dok To have more in store for the men of the 173rd Airborne. They are about to face the fiercest battle of their lives. November 12th, 1967. The Sky Soldiers of the 173rd 2nd Battalion are regrouping after a disastrous ambush on the slopes of Dok To that just cost them 20 lives and over 150 casualties. They know this jungle is thick with North Vietnamese, yet it is still the mission of the 173rd to head straight into their lair and spoil their plans to launch an attack on Dok To. There is no way out but forward. While American F-100 Phantoms and 105mm howitzers batter the hills, hoping to dislodge the North Vietnamese, the units on the ground patrol the primeval forest, uneasily well aware that they are being watched. There was an air of tension. Something was wrong. Those of us that had any time there felt it. The newer guys didn't know what was going on. On November 18, the 173rd gets word that a Green Beret reconnaissance team has discovered a sizable concentration of NVA on Hill 875, so named on military maps because it's estimated to be 875 meters high, or about 740 yards from bottom to top. It is the call the 173rd has been waiting for. Three companies of the 2nd Battalion, almost 330 men, are immediately ordered to Hill 875 to flush out the North Vietnamese soldiers hiding there. They find many disturbing signs of NVA presence at the base of Hill 875. Well-worn paths and exposed radio wire show just how entrenched the NVA are on this hill. Gary Buzz Cox, 19, the point man for his squad, finds himself walking uphill 875 into an obvious NVA stronghold. There were steps cut in the hill going up, and uh, comma wire, and there was a hand railing on the steps, and we'd never seen anything like that before. We knew then that they were up there, they were well dug in, and uh, this was not gonna be a little firefight. They were not trying to hide themselves. And it spooked me, and it spooked a lot of the guys that had been there longer than I'd been there. 
the men spend an uneasy night at the base of Hill 875. The next morning, November 19th, the brigade chaplain, Father Waters, holds Sunday mass in the chill mountain air. The ritual only adds to the general sense of foreboding as they prepare to head up the hill. It started kind of with a communion by Father Waters, which was, um, we'd never done anything like that before. So we had our communion, which I, I, in my heart, I kind of thought we were taking last rites. Even non-Catholics join the solemn ceremony. 19-year-old Sergeant Jim Hoppy Hopkins of South Dakota decides he will take communion for the first time. I sure am glad that I did. Maybe it had something to do with it, maybe it didn't. You know, I'm not a great believer, but, but I certainly did do some believing that day and a whole lot of thinking. While some men question their faith, others question the wisdom of attacking the NVA head on. Mike Fole, from Chicago's northwest side, has been in Vietnam for seven months and figures he knows his way around. But this mission seems to him like just plain suicide. They told us to our face there was at least a dug-in regiment up there. Then we just looked at each other like we're dead men. Before the men head uphill 875, American F-100 Phantoms drop bombs and napalm on the suspected enemy positions to give them some cover and some hope. Well, it didn't do anything because those, the NBA were dug in real good. I bet we probably walked 50, 60 yards maybe up the hill and then it all started. It's just like popcorn stuff. It's just pop, 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 and then it is, this is definitely. Three companies of the 2nd Battalion have walked into a well-planned ambush. Fire team leader Stephen Welch is in the lead as his squad moves forward. About that time, everything started opening up. They started hitting us with just about everything. We were pretty well pinned down at that point. There was just a barrage of chi -com grenades that came down at us. And it was almost as if it was slow motion. I swear I could see the revolutions of them. And uh, of course, they went and took several, several guys down behind me. And it got louder and worse. And it was, uh, you can't explain the noise. Well, you just can't explain the noise. It's men against men, and you're trying to kill each other. And as far as I can tell now, we were in a kill zone. I consider it a full ambush, battalion size ambush. The 2nd Battalion's 330 men are under attack by battle-hardened regulars of the 174th North Vietnamese Regiment, a force estimated at more than 2,000, yet none of them is visible. All you could do is shoot a puff of smoke. So I started looking at the trees and I could see a puff of smoke about 100 foot up in the trees. So I blew the tree out from under with a grenade launcher. Pretty soon there we were knocking North Vietnamese soldiers out of the trees. And uh, as I say, we did that for probably eight to 10 minutes. And then the firing became more intense, more intense. And there was just guys dead everywhere, guys that I had known for a long time. And uh, it seemed like everywhere I tried to get down behind, there was dead bodies. At an artillery base on a neighboring hill overlooking Hill 875, the men manning the 105 millimeter howitzers can only listen in horror. Their job is to support the troops on the ground, but they do not know where to direct their fire. 19-year-old Paul DiNardo is in charge of a battery of six 105s pointed at Hill 875, but he doesn't know where to aim. All he can see and hear is chaos. It was the most horrendous noise I've ever heard in my entire life. It was, uh, it, if you could only could see maybe about 100 chainsaws going off at the same time fully powered, and you heard this roaring going through the jungle for that would last maybe about five, eight seconds, and it would slow down. Then you'd hear this roaring going up again. The three companies of the 173rd on the hill realize they are surrounded by the North Vietnamese. Their only chance to beat back the enemy is to call for close fire and airstrikes, almost on top of their position, at considerable risk to themselves. And you could look up and see the pilot's face when he was dropping the bombs. I remember the, the bombs would bounce you right off the ground, or it, may, or it felt like it did when they were hitting. 
Finally, with coordinates called in from the ground, Paul DiNardo orders his 105 howitzers to pour their shells on the enemy positions. They can only pray that they're not hitting Americans. Friendly fire, with their own bombs and shells landing on them, is the last thing these men need. Now and then you would have a round that would hit a tree and shrapnel would hit the guys. You couldn't help that because they're calling in close support. They had called in artillery again, closer, and this time it hit in the canopy up above. A big chunk of it came down, hit me in the leg, so we backed it off again. The jungle makes even close support impossible. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the hill decide their only hope is to charge the enemy positions. The troops are ordered to run uphill and engage the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, an enemy they still have yet to actually see. They wanted all gunners and grenadiers online, and uh, that's when my, probably my whole life passed before me. All I could think of was mother, father, brother, sister, friends, girlfriends, but I, I truly thought that I was probably going to die. It was probably the hardest thing we'd ever done, I'd ever personally done. I didn't think we were going to make this one, but it's what we had to do. But the North Vietnamese are too well entrenched, and they easily beat back the American charge. Everybody was waving at us to come back. <laughs> it was a flight of sheer terror, I suppose. To, uh, to get back to our own lines. And in the course of that, I actually fell in, back into this trench that we had cleared, and I fell between two North Vietnamese soldiers and um, dispensed with them, and then got up, and I remember the bullets and everything going by me, and somehow they just didn't hit me. It seemed like everywhere I went, every mood I made, I was being shot at. I had four dead guys around me, two wounded. And the medic came up alongside of me. I told him, Doc, I said, you better get the hell out of here. I said, they got this place pegged. I looked to my left, looked to my right. The medic had taken a bullet in the forehead. The medics who are still alive, like Steve Camp, can barely keep up. And there was guys there with their legs blown off, they were alive, arms blown off, that needed morphine cerettes. I only had 16 on me, personally, and I went through those like, and within five, 10 minutes, they were gone. Through all the noise, the shooting, the shouts, and the screams, Father Waters is tending the wounded on the battlefield, seemingly impervious to the war around him. Father Waters was sitting there, sitting straight up, had a wounded man in his lap, and he was giving him his last rites. But when I looked back, and I looked at Father Waters, and the sun just happened to be shining down through the trees on him, and of course with the smoke and everything, and Father Waters looked at me and just smiled at me. By five o'clock that afternoon, after battling for more than seven hours, the Americans are still surrounded as night falls. Enemy mortar rounds continued to land on the surviving soldiers who were dangerously low on supplies. For reasons still shrouded in mystery, the NVA do not attack that night. But as darkness settles over Hill 875, the terrified Americans are hungry, thirsty, and low on ammunition. All too aware that they are still surrounded, they know they must complete their mission against all odds and drive the NVA from the top of Hill 875, even if it means losing their lives to do it. Dark comes quickly in the Central Highlands, particularly under the thick foliage of the dense jungle of Hill 875 at Dok Tho. At the end of a terrible day of battle, the night of November 19, 1967, gives the men of the 173rd, 2nd Battalion a chance to regroup. We had consolidated all of our wounded. We tried to kind of put them in one, one place, and there was this huge tree that was large and old, and it was kind of our base where to get, you know, we could get the wounded in. And of course, we had the medics there, and at this time, um, what officers were still alive were, were over there too. 
As the soldiers on the ground try to make the best of a bad situation, the sky is lit by bright flares on tiny parachutes meant to mark enemy positions for American bombers. But on that fateful night, one flare inadvertently drifts over the American camp. It becomes the target for the bomber. I can hear the aircraft getting closer and closer and closer. Personally, I had this foreboding sense that something was going to happen. I, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew something was wrong. I was in a hole with another individual and turned around, saw the jet heading right for us. And I saw the bomb leave the plane. And as the bomb left the plane, it looked like it was heading right towards us. I was in the trench when I heard it coming down. It was just, you know, just a, just, a, just a whirling sound in it. You could hear it coming, and you're thinking, oh, God, that sounds like it's coming right at us. The American pilot makes a tragic mistake and drops a 500-pound bomb on the American command post, where the surviving officers are planning their next move, and the medics are treating the wounded. It is a direct hit. And it just, this huge explosion, that, bright light, and concussion. It was the biggest ball of fire I've ever seen in my life, and I was right in the middle of it. It's just a ball of fire. It sort of knocked me out, or I, I couldn't hear. I'm not sure how long it was, but um, I, I don't think it was maybe 30 seconds. And I remember seeing nothing but psychedelic lights, and it was like my head was in a vice and somebody was just turning it as fast as they could, which was concussion. And thinking that my head was gonna explode any second. Um, it was quiet for, I'd say, t good 10 to 15 seconds. And all of a sudden we could hear them screaming that their legs were gone, calling for their mothers. And essentially we didn't know how many of us were left then. I checked the hole to the left and everybody was dead there. They were just, they were just blown all over the place. And then the hole next to them, everybody was wasted. It will go down in history as one of the worst incidents of friendly fire in the entire war. More than 40 Sky Soldiers are dead, including 11 medics and many officers. Among the dead is Father Waters, who had been ministering to the wounded and giving last rites to the dying. Doc Camp is one of only two surviving medics. You're looking at guys that, you know, they're your buds, they're your brothers, and you can't do anything for them. Yeah, you just you can't do anything. And they're looking at you like, help me, I'm in pain and this and that, and you can't. Yeah. There was just limbs and they, there was horrible, horrible, horrible wounds. And, um, we had no medical supplies, we had no water, we had, we had nothing to do and just tried to help as best we could, but most of them were double and triple amputations and it was just horrible. The man on my right was bleeding to death and crying for his mother and asking God, why me? It's hard to sit there and wait for a man to bleed to death uh, and be calm but I, I had to wait, you know, for him to bleed to death. The survivors try to hang on through the long night. Over their one working radio, they hear that reinforcements are on the way. Over 300 men of the 4th Battalion of the 173rd are coming to their aid on foot, but it will take them at least a day to get there. Through the night and into the second day, the NVA continue to fire on the beleaguered American troops, but they still do not charge the men of the 173rd. Not until the end of that second day, nearly 32 hours after the first ambush, does the 4th Battalion reach the bomb site. In the lead is 23-year-old West Point graduate, second lieutenant, Al Linseth. I remember thinking it odd because there were steps cut in the hill. And I remember seeing, for me at least, the first time uh, a significant numbers of American soldiers, dead American soldiers, and uh, along both sides of the trail. And 
that was a sight I'll never forget. At 28, the 4th Battalion senior medic, Lynn Morse, is an old man amongst the teenagers and a 10-year veteran, a career soldier. He has never walked into a hell like this one. The uh, stench of napalm death was all around you. The moans and groans of the wounded was all around you. It was pitch black. Machine gunner Jerry Rocky Stone, a native Tennessean with the 4th Battalion, steps gingerly onto the killing zone of Hill 875 and is nearly speechless. And as we start going up the hill, there's bodies, you know, there's American bodies, Vietnamese bodies, uh, and they're getting, some of them, you know, they're getting right because they've been there a day in that sun, and it was hot, you know. But we are, for the first time, facing the morbidity of walking amongst our own dead. The valley floor and the approach to this hill was covered with our own dead. Just when it seems that everyone might well be dead, some survivors of the 2nd Battalion appear out of the darkness. We start running into guys from 2nd Bat, and they're begging for water, they're begging for cigarettes, anything, you know, and they're just like, uh, like they're crazy. That was probably one of the happy days of my life, seeing some new people, some, some more people, because we didn't have many left by then. We were worried about being overrun and, and wiped out to a man. Although the 4th Battalion had to travel light on its dangerous trek through the jungle, the men still carried extra supplies. When they reach the men of the 2nd Battalion, they gladly give away what food and water they can. When they got there and they reinforced us, the thing I remember most was the, um, it was the look on their face. And they looked at us and Boy, I knew that we, we were bad. We, we were hurt bad because you could see it in their face. The most phenomenal thing that we saw was the heroism of each of the wounded. Most of them refused morphine because it might take away from their buddy. The men of the 4th Battalion minister to the wounded throughout the night. With the 2nd Battalion's help, they dig in on the side of Hill 875. As dawn breaks on the third day, American F-100 Phantom Jets and 105mm howitzers resume their heavy attacks on the North Vietnamese bunkers at the summit. But the enemy shows no signs of giving up. Enemy gunners keep on bombarding the bloody American battlefield with heavy mortars and B-40 rockets. Each time a shell lands on or near the Americans, shrapnel hits some men of the 2nd Battalion for the third time. Despite the enemy fire, the 173rd have had a chance to cut a landing zone for the helicopters. And that means the seriously wounded Sky Soldiers have a chance of getting out. The helicopter could land on the surface. These men had to be literally picked up and shoved into helicopters because of the tremendous amount of damaged folds on the ground. And then on their takeoff, they take rounds again. As many as 12 helicopters are heavily damaged or shot down during this third day on Hill 875. But chopper pilots like Gary Bass keep returning despite relentless enemy fire. And there's these great big red, white, and green fireballs that look like they're going between your feet, except the ones that are slamming into the helicopter that you can hear on the way out. I must have carried 60 to 80 wounded out that day. I think it was a time to look inside our soul, and I, and I think it was a time to say, we've all come this far together, and, and we're gonna get out of this, we're gonna make it. The men of the 173rd Airborne are more determined than ever to finish what they started. They know they will not leave without taking that hill, even if it kills them. Tuesday, November 21, 1967 day three of the battle for Hill 875. The men of the 173rd have survived an ambush by the North Vietnamese, the war's most terrible incident of friendly fire, and more than two days of intense jungle fighting. But the North Vietnamese are still entrenched, 
the Americans still surrounded for the moment. The Americans are resolved to take Hill 875 and change that balance. For the next two days, there is almost no let up in the fighting. American F-100 Phantoms and 105 Howitzers continue to shell the enemy positions, while the North Vietnamese relentlessly fire their AK-47s, their B-40 rockets, and their heavy mortars at anything that moves. And we were all in shell shock right then. My God, between our stuff, theirs, on a mortar or artillery or a bomb, it's just cutting, it's screaming through the air. You can hear it just cutting, just cutting through the air. And uh, it gets to you. You just tighten up and hope it doesn't hit you. There's nothing you can do. The 4th Battalion knows the only way out is up. As they plan an assault on the top of the hill, the men of the battered 2nd Battalion, here since the first day, refuse to stay behind. They too want to face their brutal enemy head on. But I know in my company it's very personal. And uh, the men I was with, we decided that ah, this is our property. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. Well, that didn't work out at all because the first time we, we started up the hill, the return fire that we got was so heavy, you know, we only made it 25 meters and we're all pinned down. I remember being right on the ground, I mean, as close to the ground as I could get, and having the uh, person right next to me shot through the head. And I mean, it was, it was intense fire. They're there, they're shooting at us, but we can't see them, you know? And they're in these bunkers, in these trenches and stuff. They're all well dug in. It was just extremely intense. It was just as bad as the first day. And it, uh, I think it takes a little piece of your heart. I, I thought maybe it was going to be a little easier, but we didn't get very far. We took horrendous casualties again and called off the assault. It was uh, just devastating. After another uneasy night, the men of the 173rd awaken to the permanent twilight of this jungle. It is Thursday, November 23, the start of day five of the battle for Hill 875. After four days of heavy action, the men have just enough fight left in them for one more push. With 300 men of the 4th Battalion in the lead and the remaining men of the decimated 2nd Battalion alongside them, the Sky Soldiers begin one more attempt to reach the top of Hill 875. I guess our pride got in the way of our common sense, but we, we wanted to be part of what the, the group that took the hill. We didn't want to be the one sitting down when somebody else was fighting our battle force. Braced for another tough battle, the Americans inch up the hill, listening for anything that might give them a sense of their enemy. They hear nothing. We started moving forward, and uh, we didn't get any fire. And, and we got up to that first bunker, and I jumped in it. And uh, it was pretty deep, and there was a NVA soldier down there, half dead, sort of dazed, and um, you know I just sort of kicked kicked him aside, and we just kept sort of running up the hill, and uh, about halfway up I thought oh, they pulled away, you know <laughs> we're going to make it. It was befuddling to me because there was nobody there, there weren't bodies, there they were gone. The enemy that has wrought such damage on the American force has simply disappeared. In the eerie quiet on the shattered hilltop, splintered trees, destroyed bunkers, and a few dead are all that remain of the North Vietnamese. And they found some mass graves there, and a lot of the bunkers have been torn up pretty good by then, but the bunkers were 20 feet deep with interlocking logs. Like, they have five to six layers of trees just interlocked like this. That's why they could withstand all the air, pump, air and artillery. The men don't know whether to celebrate or weep at this end of their five-day battle. The extent of the NVA fortifications makes them shudder. As they wait to be lifted off the hill to rest for the first time in five days, a special dinner is flown in. It is only then they realize it is Thanksgiving Day. I knew it was Thanksgiving Day when they brought in Thanksgiving dinner. 
which was a big mistake. I couldn't eat turkey for years after that. You know, still turkey, the smell of, you know, turkey sets me off. It was Thanksgiving Day, but, uh, you know, it was another day in Vietnam. <laughs> Dinner. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to sit down and enjoy something like that after that. I don't like Thanksgiving. Sorry. Price was too high for the meal. The media and the government trumpeted the battle for Hill 875 as a great victory for American forces. It was hardly that. Though they had spoiled any NVA plans to overrun Docto, American troops had paid for it dearly. It was not just the 158 Americans who died in that battle and are inscribed on this wall. Another 300 were wounded and all the survivors of Doc Toe would bring back emotional scars for the rest of their lives. An estimated 1,500 North Vietnamese were killed there, but most of their bodies were never found. As they had done so often in the war, the NVA had removed their dead and wounded from the battlefield, leaving little behind but trails of blood and a brigade of battered American soldiers feeling they had fought ghosts and achieved little. Two days after the troops took control of Hill 875, they were ordered to abandon it. We took the hill, but for what? We turned around and gave it right back to them. You know, if we'd have held it, Maybe it could have saved some more GIs lives later on because they turned right around and went back to using it again. You know? And that was a, a, a common theme of the, of the whole war. Take it, abandon it, let them have it back, and go back and take it again. You know? Didn't make any sense. We paid this price for this mountain, and uh, they were taking me off it, and we'd paid for it inch by inch in our blood, blood of the brothers we lost. And uh, I, I think the war began to change for me because when I looked down, I, I thought I was going to have to come back. I, I couldn't understand what, why we had made this sacrifice and why we were leaving it. But that's what we did. We was on search and destroy. And we search and we destroy, and then you might have to, that man on that same hill again, you have to search him out and destroy him again. The following named men have given their lives since the 2nd Battalion's arrival in Dak To. Specialist 5, Taylor. Specialist 4, Cantu. The battle and the war seemed terribly senseless to those who honored their dead at Dock Toe in the traditional paratrooper ritual called the Ceremony of the Boots. And Major Waters, our battalion chaplain. That was a very sad time. Uh, they had got all the boots that they could find in second bat supply, and they still didn't have enough boots for every man that had got killed. There's not many of us, it's just boots. My, my company was ineffective. We were shot to pieces. I wanted so bad to just go, this is a bunch of crap, break ranks and walk out and walk away and see what they would do about it. But I figured, well, everybody else is putting up what I guess I should too. You know, and I guess, I figure you owe something to the dead guys too, give them a little respect, but it really just aggravated me, the whole situation, it was like, I felt like I had my nose rubbed in it again. Dear God, let us remember that death is a gateway to heaven. Give these brave troopers I was angry. I was angry. I don't know why that happened. I, I felt it was for uh, show. I felt it was for show. 
wasn't necessary. That's all. Nothing, not even the ceremony of the boots, could help these men forget the terrible battle that had changed each of them forever. They joined the army as patriots, young men who wanted to serve their country. But after the carnage on Hill 875, their idealism had faded away. Duty and honor would no longer be as important as their own survival and that of their friends. You're sitting there with uh, other men's blood on you bullet holes in your clothing and bullet holes in your gun and and to you wonder how you made it you know why why uh, somebody sit touching shoulders with you gets killed and you don't you know well most of us were only 19 20 years old and we thought we were the baddest guys on this god's given earth but we found out there was a little man over in Southeast Asia that would kick your ass in a minute and kill you. And we certainly lost a lot of good boys. I guess I thought we were men back then, but when I look back, and we were nothing but boys. Couldn't have a beer, couldn't vote, but by God, we could kill. For 31 years on Thanksgiving Day, in the evening, I poured a glass of Jose Cuervo. I walked out in my backyard, and I remembered every young kid I lost there. And uh, had one for him. Some historians have said that Doc To was an important test of American will that stopped the North Vietnamese from driving across the middle of South Vietnam and cutting the country in half. But only weeks later, the North Vietnamese would occupy the Central Highlands once more, this time in preparation for the Tet Offensive that would start only two months later in January 1968. But whatever it meant to the Pentagon, the battle for Doc To was a turning point for the men of the 173rd Airborne. After this terrible battle, it was clear to them that Westmoreland's war was a war of attrition and that even his favored fire brigade was just part of the strategy, kill and be killed. At Doc To, the 173rd Airborne had done both with honor. Thank you for watching this edition of the Service with Honor video collection. A portion of the proceeds from this program provide valuable funds exclusively for your VFW department. We're proud to present a collection which so clearly illustrates the heroism of the brave men and women who with honor and valor proudly served our country.